Call this meeting to order. Welcome everybody. My name is Joe McGivern. I chair the Hoyoke City Council's Finance Committee. Members of the committee, uh, to my right, Councilor Tallman. To my left, Councilor Jordan. To his left, Councilor Powell. Sorry, Will. I was doing pretty good the last week. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, our fifth member is in Boston and is on his way, but he hopefully Recording we stopped. Go. Oh. Oh. Just keep going. Okay. okay. That was the Wizard of Oz telling us to just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, our, our fifth member, voting member of this committee, uh, Juan Anderson Burgos, uh, is hoping to join us shortly when he gets back from Boston. Uh, we have a number of guests on Zoom. We have a number of guests in the chambers. Uh, presently, we do not have any other city councilors on Zoom, but we will uh, let you know. Jose Maldonado. Oh, sorry, Councilor Jose Maldonado is, is with us uh, on Zoom. Uh, we are being broadcast. We are being broadcast on the Cable Access Network live. We are on Zoom. We are being recorded by Zoom. We are being streamed. Uh, we are not hybrid this evening, so we don't need any roll call votes uh, to do anything uh, by state law. And we just need to uh, get the meeting going. There are three items before we go to the main event. Uh, they should not take long. We ask uh, all of our special guests just to bear with us. I'll make a motion to take item number one off the table for discussion. Motion made and second to take item one off the table for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Uh, this is introduced under my name on behalf of the mayor that a transfer of $30,000 from heavy motor equipment operator into supplies traffic lines be made. Uh, it's off the table for discussion. We are joined, as always, by the mayor, and we are joined by our superintendent of the DPW, Carl Rossi. Carl, how are you doing tonight? Good, how are you guys doing? We're doing great, welcome. Uh, Carl, this is a, a transfer request, as you know, uh, we asked to do it in two parts. Uh, why, there, and we know the answer, but we'd like to hear it on record. Why is there a surplus in the heavy motor equipment operator line item? And what do you propose to do with the uh, $30,000 in the uh, supplies line item? Uh, there's a surplus of money in the heavy equipment uh, operator line item because uh, positions haven't been filled yet. There are about nine positions that haven't been filled that we're looking to fill, but in the meantime, we have a surplus in those line items. And uh, what we're using them for is that we, in the fall of last year, 2022, we uh, completed some work for some striping and we have to pay that bill and that was in the amount of about $22,000. Uh, the other $7,000 is going to do, uh, it's for supplies and paint to do crosswalks and speed humps in the city as council orders for the past couple of months that I've been receiving. So I want to get that work done before the end of the fiscal year. Thank you. And th this is a bill that is already, the work has already been done? Correct. Okay. And I take it, Carl, that was before your time, right? Correct. Because I know the sheriff over here, our auditor, Tanya Dorjek, would tell you, you can't spend money if you don't have it. Correct. That's one of the reasons why we did the transfer is to cover, the, cover that invoice, but also to do the work that uh, the council would like us to do for the remaining crosswalks under council orders to make sure we have the supplies first before we can do the work. I, I can speak for everybody. I know you're gonna hear a couple people, but we are big advocates of keeping the, uh, the traffic lines, the, uh, whether it be crosswalks at the uh, intersections or uh, parking or whichever in, in up to date because it's, it's, a, it's a safety issue. And it just makes a lot of sense uh, that we that we do keep them up to date. And certainly, I will support whatever you need to do that. Is there any discussion? I make a motion to be approved. Sorry. Motion made and second that it be approved. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Carl, thank you. That was an easy one. Thank you very much, Ken. Yeah. Appreciate it. Motion to take. That'll be at our next city council agenda next week, next Tuesday. Motion to take item number two off the table. Second. Motion to second. We take item two off the table. Introduce under my name for the mayor. It's a request a transfer of one thousand dollars from supplies to overtime, and this is out of the board of health uh, budget. All those in favor? Aye, Any aye. opposed? So moved. Um, 
Jeff, do we have Sean with us or? No, I, I put in the email that he was not available, but he sent along a memo that's attached to the order in your packet. Thank you. Uh, our Board of Health Director has uh, communicated to us via via email that he's not available to attend this meeting. And what he's asking for is when he submitted his budget for fiscal 23, requested a sufficient amount of funding for his overtime budget, did not anticipate the cost for the year when the budget was finalized, my overtime line was slashed to zero. Uh, he diplomatically doesn't say if it was the mayor or the city council who did that, but that's, it was the mayor. <laughs> I have previously two similar requests. Uh, it goes on to uh, explain that with the uh, this particular one is with the road race, road race weekend and parade weekend, a lot of his uh, inspectors were out there doing some uh, some due diligence duty, and uh, certainly that requires uh, what would be legitimate overtime. Um, he's asking the, su the surplus is in his supplies. And uh, he knows he's good for the rest of the year with the uh, with that line item, even if we do make the transfer. Any discussion, Mayor? Uh, just to add further, because it wasn't so. So although it was at zero, I um, oh my God, Tanya, help me out here. So overtime work was being done, assuming that the work that they were doing was eligible for. You said SWAT or Flex Squad. Yeah, they were they were charging they were charging off some of the overtime in error on their sheet to right. the SWAT overtime, and when we sent it for approval from ARPA, we realized those were charged in error. So we ended up having to move a thousand dollars worth of expenses back into the Board of Health budget, which put them in deficit. Right. So it wasn't like I mean, knowing that it was budget at zero, it wasn't like they were planning to charge that line, uh, but the work was already done. We still had to pay the employees and that's what caused it to go in the negative when that, when that was done, so. Sure. And Mr. Councilor Drenning. Yeah, and whereas they're taking it from their current budget and the fact that this is not gonna be ongoing over time, this was, appears, they thought they had this other pot to use or should have used and didn't realize that they couldn't, so. I think we should approve this. I'll make a motion to approve it. Yes, second. Motion made second to approve and refer this to the full city council next week. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Thank you, Mayor. One more. Motion to take item number three off the table for discussion. Motion made second to take item three off the table for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Uh, this is a request for transfer. It's for from the police department. Coming from sick, uh, sick leave buyback, 35,000, vacation buyback, 12,800, time old, 35,000, totaling 82,800. Going to supplies, others, 1,000, energy, 35,000, legal defense, 3,000, medical, 8,000, in-state travel, 2,000, repair and motor vehicles, uh, repair and maintenance motor vehicles, 16,000, motor vehicle supplies, 17,000. <coughs> Sorry, Jeff, but do we have our chief with us tonight or someone from the police department? I'm here, Joe. Yeah, yep, there he is. Oh, th th hey, David. Chief Pratt has joined us uh, via Zoom. Uh, David is off the table for discussion. Can you just give us the transfer request? Why does surp we, we already know, but for, to be on the record, but why does surpluses in these three line items and then what you're proposing to do and where the transfers are going to? Okay, so um, these three line items are in surplus, um, basically be due to um, the buyback line items and people that haven't retired and aren't retiring, um, that that's where the surplus comes from. Um, the lines they're going into are um, line items that are just short, um, that we maybe budgeted, under budgeted, when we when we did it, some of them were cut. Um, ener energy is basically our electric bill. That was sort of way under. We we were at 110 at the start of the year. And, um, it's it's been averaging more like 12 or 13 a, a month. So um, that one was under even at our original number. I think we were at one. 
I remember correctly, it was like 128 we had asked for. I think we still would have been a little under even at that number. But I think that's just due to cost, you know, energy costs are up, as you know. Supplies, supplies other is mainly for, that's things like shirts for our records personnel, our water, our cable, and our ID badges, things of that nature. It's just, that one was short as well. Legal defense, I think we originally had asked for like 14 and we got four and we're going to need about three more. We have about 11 or 12 more that need to be paid. That's contractual. Where we, the legal defense, if you don't recall, is the, where it's contractual, we pay half of the legal defense fund for the enrollment. Medical, the 8800 is, most of the medical stuff is all from the new hires. The cost there is roughly about 1200 for each one. I believe we started the year in that account with only like 13,000. And we've already, you know, we hired just this year alone 17 people. So we need to make up the shortage there. In-state travel is just, you know, obviously for in-state travel or mainly trainings or classes that are, you know, in-state and when we have to go to meetings or whatever across the state. The R&M motor vehicle, repair and maintenance motor vehicle, I believe we started the year there with about 65. We had requested 90. We're looking for 16 there, which is going to bring us to about 81 for the year. And the motor vehicle supply. So the R&M, just to throw a little of what that exactly is, is that one is, you know, it's cost for the repair and maintenance. Some of the cars, as you know, the previous cars were not under the warranties that we're currently going with. And we have several of those cars coming up for tune-ups, which are about $1,800 a car. I believe we have five of those coming up on the 2020s, the older Explorers. So that's what that money is for. And then the motor vehicle supplies, I believe our original ask there was 80,000. We started with 66. This will bring us up to about 83. But combined with those two accounts, we're still a little under our original ask. And that one, we have a real important item there is our air conditioning machine that services our cruiser's air conditioner so that we can service them ourselves. That needs repair. So we want to, you know, obviously fix that. Otherwise, we have to send the cars out, which is more costly. So I believe that's going to be somewhere between $1,100 and $1,500. But, you know, every car, if we send it out to get the air conditioners fixed, would certainly, over time, this is certainly an expense we want to deal with. And then the rest is tires and oil and brakes and that. So that's all of them broken down. The combined number, I believe, is 82,800. We have that surplus in our buyout line item. And I just want to move it over there to take care of the shortages to get through the year. And thank you, Chief. And we'll get you through the rest of the year, two months to go. Yes, I believe so. Any discussion? Legal defense. Chief, just walk us through that again. How is that number calculated again, please? So it's, I believe it's 100 and, what our portion is to pay is $155. That's half of the cost of each officer to be under the legal defense fund. It's a contractual obligation. 
and but not every officer takes advantage of that that's where the the bigger number at the beginning of the year we we put it in and i know we talked about this at like budget hearings and stuff and i think we're starting to kind of zero in on the number i mean this year we might have undershot it a little bit but it does change as we bring new people on you know they they might be inclined or or not inclined to to take advantage of that and not everyone does but the ones that do we're, we're obligated to pay like i said i think we started the year in that account at four thousand and we need another three to i think to finish up this year which would um be seven so you know certainly we're starting to zero in that we don't need all 14 at the start of the year but sometimes depending on new officers if all 17 of these new officers come in and decide to have that bonus then we're going to have to have that as well okay so essentially the numbers off because it's kind of hard to calculate at the beginning of the year it's a relatively new benefit and as a result we're just getting closer to what we think the actual is correct i think when, when it first came on you know we just times to buy everybody that could potentially ask for it and then you know i think at the meetings and when we discussed it we, we felt it was good to cut it down mm -hmm. and, and then always like this come back and and i think we're starting to zero in though i think we can be a little more accurate hopefully going forward okay unless there's other questions i'm ready to make a motion any further discussion I'll make a motion to be approved. Second. Motion made second that we approve. Refer this to the full city council next Tuesday. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. That brings us to the most important part of our agenda this evening. Motion to take item number four off the table for discussion. Second. Motion made second we take item four off the table for discussion. This is a communication sent to the full city council on April 13th from our mayor. The uh, superintendent of schools, Ant Mayor Joshua Garcia, superintendent of schools, Anthony Soda, Aaron Burnell, school committee member, and the SBC vice chair, school building committee vice chair. Along with a number of special guests, we welcome everybody this evening. There are two items left on our agenda, this being the first item, which I think is appropriate, that we go into a presentation of the hard work of the school building committee over the last, I believe, year and a half. I'd like to thank all the members of that committee on behalf of the City Council for your, for your work. It's been tremendous. I've caught a lot of it <clears throat> online myself. I've snuck into the, uh, I call it the parlor a couple of times and <laughs> told Aaron not to let me in, but I just wanted to listen. And very important, our City Council member, Peter Tallman, was both our liaison and our voice, and he has kept us up to date. Your work has been tremendous. The presentation, uh, I think, makes sense. <clears throat> I'm sure there's going to be a few qu qu questions. But the second item on the agenda is what it becomes our job and our responsibility. Uh, the mayor has put, as required, a number on a bond, a number that re currently represents the cost of this project. Uh, revenue sources are MSBA, a formula that I promised Margaret Wood we will not talk about this evening. <laughs> um, we, we will be careful how we talk about it this evening. Uh, other revenue sources that the mayor has talked about and, and certainly the superintendent has talked about in the past and uh, ways that we can make this as affordable as possible into the, the full budget of the city. And the full budget not only includes the city side of the budget, but includes the school side of the budget too, because we're all we're all in this together. So with that in mind, Mayor, I'm just going to look to you. I know people look comfortable, but we have plenty of seats in here with mics. So anybody that's talking, please feel free to come in, grab a, a desk and a mic. For those of you for the first time that you've been here, the mics. All you do is hit a button, you get a green light, and you're on. If you want to turn the mic off, just hit the button, and it's off. Uh, we have a few people online while everybody's coming in. Uh, from Hilltop Securities, uh, Cinder McNary is what does. Cinder, welcome. Aaron Linville's there. Aaron Linville from the school department is with us. I know she carefully guided this, this school building committee through many nights, and uh, we appreciate you being with us, Aaron. And I just lost everybody, but. 
No, it's not that. Jeff, Jeff, our Wizard of Oz is our administrative assistant, and she got us, he got us into the, uh, the, the, uh, the bullet, the, the slideshow really quick. But uh, if I'm missing anybody up, from the law department, uh, attorney Michael Bissonnette is with us too. And Mike, of course, is the former mayor of Chicopee and fully aware of this process. Uh, City Councilor Linda Bacon has joined us. Jenny Rivera. Jenny Rivera is with us, City Councilor. Israel Rivera is with us, City Councilor. And at the moment, I think that's everybody, but welcome. Um, again, presentation of where we are with this project, I think, is most important. Uh, it is and has been the purview of the School Building Committee. Uh, and I know the mayor looks, is listed as the chair of the School Building Committee, but Aaron Burnell, I, you know, I wish you could run some city council meetings because you kept those guys moving very quickly he did. every time I watched you. You know, <laughs> those, anybody that doesn't know you, Aaron, we're like a little scared at first going, you know, we got we to gotta keep this moving. But Mayor, would you like to lead us? Would you like to start? And, and in the audience, and Ronnie, you're always welcome, is a member of the committee, but one of the longest serving officials in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Ronnie Collinmore, our Ward 6 uh, school committee member. Welcome, Ron. And the three school committee ladies in the back as well have joined us. Yeah, Millie's yep. back there. and uh, Millie, welcome, so welcome. Irene's And former there. city councilor. And Ellie Wilson's there. Mark is with us, Mark Lubold. Mark, member, Mark member you of the were on committee. the committee, right, Mark? What's that? You were on the committee, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and still am, good. Yeah. Still is an active voice. Yes. And our, I think everybody knows the city auditor, but Tanya is on her little <laughs> desk over there, and she's just having fun. <laughs> city treasurer, which will be the next line item more than this line item, I think, but we do want to recognize you, Rory. Mayor, please, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, councilors. Thank you so much for making time and allowing us to come in front of you tonight. <laughs> I'm joined tonight by members of the building committee, our city treasurer, our financial advisor, who's on virtually, as well as uh, members from the design team and our OPM. Um, our co-chair here, Aaron Brunel, um, is gonna introduce them shortly. Um, but I did wanna just open up a little bit and just share that, you know, obviously today we're coming together as neighbors so that we can understand and make a decision that will have an impact on the trajectory of the city as well as our entire education system. I can't stress enough how much I appreciate the discourse of this community has had starting as early as 2013 in regard to moving away from the K-8 model and bringing back middle schools. The discourse even got heated during a very friendly campaign process when there was a vote over override ballot question to build new middle schools and um, had failed at that time. After that experience, the message to me was incredibly clear that this community wants to build a middle school and take care of the needs of our youth, but we wanna do it, um, we need, to, we, we wanna build what we need at the most feasible option available that the city can afford within our budget limits and without a debt exclusion. This discourse continued throughout the, uh, the, throughout the time moving forward and even on the building committee. And the building committee had a keen focus on that goal and I'm thrilled to share with you that what will be presented tonight achieves exactly that and that is largely thanks to everybody, everybody in this room who has participated in this process as early as 2013. No matter where you stood on um, the spectrum of when the votes took place, there is a share, I know that there was a shared desire by everybody to want to build the middle school, but to build what we need, the most feasible option available. And what's going to be presented tonight, I think you'll, I think you'll agree that you'll see that. There was a great deal of due diligence um, put into this to achieve exactly that. And again, I just wanted to thank every member in this community from as early as 2013 who's put in their voice, who's contributed to this conversation for the last 10 years that has ultimately resulted in this presentation of what you're gonna see tonight. Um, uh, with that being said, I'm gonna pass it now to Aaron who will do introductions. All right, thank you, Mayor Garcia. Um, so as you all know, the committee was originally uh, formed by our previous mayor. Um, 
And one of the specific things that the MSBA outlines is the dynamic of your committee. You have to have certain people throughout the community. You want to make sure that you have a very well diversified group of people. Um, so you have the list with you there and it's on the screen. I won't go over each person specifically, but I would like to note that we have continuously, at least monthly, if not every other month, reviewed our matrix, making sure we're compliant, filling in gaps where we need to. For example, we added Anya Ryan, who's a wonderful member of the community and happens to be a landscape architect, so we felt like she would be a really great voice, so we added her in just a few months ago. Um, we're making sure that we have parents, grandparents, advocates for the public schools, staff members, uh, people involved in the maintenance facilities, people involved in the finance of it. So it's a very well diversified group um, and we've had extremely great attendance at all of the meetings. Uh, fortunately, they are being held virtually. So that makes it really easy for our community members to participate. And then as far as our project team goes, we have Margaret Wood. She is our o uh, OPM, our operations manager. Uh, we have the privilege of working with her uh, the last go round as well when we tried to bring the two, two school project through. Um, leading Mount Vernon Group is Frank Tedesco. And then we also have Dennis Daly with Mount Vernon Group, Chris LeBanc and Susan Taylor, and Hector Torres. Uh, Mount Vernon Group is our design firm, and they brought us this wonderful model school project that uh, we'll be sharing with you guys tonight. Back to you, Mayor, I believe. I think it's me. Oh, oh sorry. Over to you, Mr. Soto. <laughs> Um, no, I just want to echo what our mayor said and what Ms. Brunel said. Um, there was an incredible amount of work. And um, one thing that I really appreciate about our building committee is uh, they took the time up front, not just to focus on this project that we're working on in front of us, but to understand the history of how we got to the point that we are and how, do, how, how did we get back to the front of the line to, to see the project that we have. And in doing so, there were a lot of lessons learned. Um, primarily, the one thing that everybody took away was um, we can't have a debt o exclusion and we gotta build what we need um, at a reasonable cost that the, the city can afford in its operating budget. Mm -hmm. um, everybody shared in that, which is the reason why uh, we ultimately ended up going with the, the model school. I do have a video here. I'm not going to, it's a, I think it's a seven minute video, but the cool thing about the model school is that it's been built before. You, um, and in this video, if you watch it, which every, every member of the city council has received a, a, a link to it, you can actually see what this school is going to look like. Not um, kind of, sort of, but like a lot of, it's going to look very similar to this and it's going to be tailored to to, to Holyoke uh, and at the Peck spite, uh, site specifically. So I hope that um, anybody that's interested in this project has an opportunity to look at that video because you can see what the possibilities are. We've heard a lot of things about the model school, uh, one of them being like, oh, is it less than what we, you know, than the other design? And it's not. If you see this video, it's a very nice design. Um, and, and I hope folks can watch it. So this slide really is about why we chose the, the middle school. And I think the primary reason is because uh, we made, uh, as a building committee, we made a commitment to turn over every leaf. Um, if there is an opportunity to save money, because that was important in this process, mm -hmm. um, we're gonna look into it. So uh, thankfully we came to the council uh, earlier in the year and we, we, ex we told them, we asked them for money for a feasibility study and some language that would allow us to go with the old designers which could save some money on the design fees um, because they could pick up the old design. Um, and in, throughout that process, uh, you know, uh, we had, there were conversations about, well, if you want to save money, why don't you look into the model school process? The mayor and I and, the, and the, the entire committee said, like, if there's an opportunity to save money, let's look into it. And we did. Um, we had uh, several designers come through, including our old design. And this was the, the, the model. We ended up going the model school route because of that. A uh, little bit about the MSBI model school program. Uh, the, the, uh, it is a program that the, the MSBA offers. Um, again, these schools were built before. They're efficient in the design. They're uh, typically easier to maintain. 
Um, they meet all the requirements in terms of classroom space and science lab space that the MSBA lays, lays out, and they can easily accommodate higher and lower enrollments. Um, they're flexible in educational programming, um, and again, they can be built efficiently, cost effectively since they've been built before. The other good positive thing, which again was a, another measure of, of, of cost savings, was that the MSBA uh, also agreed to pay a portion, uh, you know, uh, reimburse a portion of the schematic design, which had we not gone with the model school process, that wouldn't have been an option. We would have been on the hook 100% uh, for those costs since we just did a schematic design uh, in 2019. The next slide is why we chose Mount Vernon Group. So we did look at several uh, designers and one of the things that stuck out about Mount Vernon Group is their attention to making sure uh, we can build it at, at an efficient cost. If you look, there's a scatter plot that the MSBA has of, of all the MSBA projects. And throughout that sc scatter plot, there is a line that goes through it that represents the average cost of each building and consistently Mount Vernon group was either at or below that line so they had a great reputation of, of building schools that were uh, cheaper than the average cost that that uh, schools are being built across the state uh, that are participating in the MSBA prop, uh, program the other uh, the other thing we did was we contacted all of their references and every single one of them spoke to they love the building they were on time and they were under budget. Uh, so that was really promising and ultimately one of the major reasons why we ended up going with Mount Vernon Group. So, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about estimated cost. Um, the um, mechanism for developing the total project cost, uh, total project budget, which is the line at the bottom, is um, an MSBA tool that they call the 3011 or the total project budget. It's, it's quite a complicated spreadsheet. So this is a roll up of about 150 lines of text and numbers. But um, in a nutshell, the process that we've been through, we've recently had two estimators estimate the project and then I have worked um, with the city and the district to make recommendations about costs for the rest of the project. One of the really great things about the MSBA um, project is it's very um, sort of all-inclusive. You know, I often, um, in situations like this, people will have questions like, well, what about the furniture? Or what about... Um, the what if the something happens in the field and we need more money I mean it's a very sort of all-inclusive number but the number here um, just to start with the the big news um, that we've come up with is 85.5 million dollars and I want to also say as you look at these numbers they look very specific um, which is the nature of generating them, but they are actually their estimates. So the intention of the total project budget is holistically to come up with a number that the city can feel comfortable is going to represent the total cost of the budget and, and the project will not exceed that, which is to say some of these numbers may go up or down, but overall the number needs to be a number that sort of incorporates contingencies and conservative costs such that if it's if we say if you sign an agreement for 85.5 million dollars with the MSBA which would be the next step um, if you decide to go ahead and fund the project that that is the number for the duration of the project now the overall project can go down in cost if it goes up in cost the MSBA does and will participate in a, that additional cost so a lot of the thinking that's gone into it by the team has been about how to incorporate you know contingencies and escalation that protect the city um, as the project moves forward over a period of about year and a half two, two years let's call it so um, I'm just going to quickly touch on what the numbers are I'm happy to take questions about this but I thought maybe we should just sort of run through the numbers and then kind of 
uh, have questions at the end. So the hard construction cost is based on a square footage that's almost exactly the same as we had for the previous project, which makes sense because the student population remains the same. 550 students, it's 106,000 square feet. Um, there are a number of fees, which we can talk about in more detail, but there's the owner's project manager, the architect, other consultants, which include you know a big range, everything from geotechnical to hazardous material abatement, as well as what's called um, builder's risk insurance. So those are all, that's all rolled up in that number. There is an estimate here for furniture fixtures and equipment for technology. And then there are the contingency numbers, which are, uh, in this case, we're using 3% of construction as the potential bucket for uh, construction contingency or so-called change orders and owner's contingency is soft costs. So that's how you get to the total of 85.5. So if we can go to the next slide, um, one of the things that's embedded in this, um, you know, going back to what the superintendent said about the choice of Mount Vernon Group, Mount Vernon Group came to the interview with a proposal um, that was clearly a money saver uh, overall, which was um, in, a, in a, a climate of escalating construction costs. The, sh the more quickly you can accomplish the project, the less your escalation. And so to achieve that, they suggested, um, and the committee has embraced and endorsed this, that we have a, a so-called early package, which would be um, bid um, pretty soon. It would actually be bid this summer, and uh, the demolition of the building would begin in the fall. So you have a project that takes about four months in which you abate, which is to say remove the hazardous materials from, demolish the existing building and kind of make the site ready for a contractor to come in. Then while that's going on, you complete the construction documents for the new building and site and you bid that separately. So um, as uh, the Mount Vernon Group, I'm really taking um, these words from Mount Vernon Group who have you know, presented this to the committee that um, this proposal frequently has resulted in their experience, and I would say in ours um, as the owner's project manager, in a reduced cost during the bid period because you're essentially removing risk from the general contractor when they bid the building because the site has already been prepared and they're able to essentially start right away. So that is what this slide is describing, is this, this sort of two-phase approach. Um, it does require um, that they start, you know, basically as soon as possible. I, this schedule proposal also does potentially result in the building being occupied uh, for the fall of 2025. Next slide. So, you know, I think these are two really important nuggets to take away. Um, as a result of um, the MSBA's uh, regulations for funding these define eligible costs, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little more uh, in a later slide, but if they are able to reimburse on eligible costs a total of $46 million, um, and the city share of the project would then therefore be $40 million. The great thing is, and Rory is going to talk about this, is that it does, um, it's clear that the city does have the ability to fund that if you choose to do so. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rory. Just thank you, Rory. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Just a quick stop. Are there any questions about the presentation so far before we go into the treasurer and the bonding and, and the meets of our meeting, uh, bolts of our responsibility. Um, Joe, I just had one time. Con uh, Councilor Jordan. And turn my microphone on. Um, just I want to make sure I heard um, from Margaret the timeline correctly. Demo to start this fall and building to be occupied in the fall of 25, so basically two years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's 
Seeing no other questions, nothing online, we welcome our treasurer. Thank you, and um, I, I will present, and of course, um, as requested by the committee, uh, Cinder uh, from Hilltop Securities is on Zoom. Uh, if there's any specific questions about the financing mechanisms um, that we're looking at. So uh, one of the things uh, that the committee had asked for uh, was, and the city has asked for is, can we afford this? Um, when we look at uh, both the five-year financial forecast that has been previously presented uh, to the committee uh, and to the council, um, and we look at our existing schedule of long-term debt, uh, the good news is, yes, uh, we can absolutely afford this. Um, one of the requests, and you'll see this on this slide, is um, what would the annual payment be um, broken out in either 20, 25, or 30-year uh, increments? Um, and that number is here. Now, you'll notice it says before any offsets. We'll talk about some of the offsets uh, very soon. Um, just so we're all clear, uh, all the numbers that you're seeing in front of you right now uh, have two base assumptions. It's the $40 million uh, cost for the city, uh, meaning once the project is done, we receive all of the reimbursements from MSBA, and then we go out to uh, roll everything into a long-term product, a long-term bond, um, that that would be uh, 40 million. Um, it could be less than that, as Margaret said, but we wanna be as conservative as possible. The other assumption that's built in all of these numbers is an interest rate of five and a half percent, which is also very conservative. Um, we could end up doing much better than that, uh, but five and a half is the number that we settled on uh, to be as conservative as possible. So if we wanna look at the next slide, This illustrates, um, and I'm, I'll break this down, how we can afford this. So uh, the yellow uh, that folks will see here represents our existing debt service. Um, so that's what we're paying now. Um, we, uh, you can see that trailing off um, over the years. Um, the blue line at the top is very important. That blue line represents a recommended uh, debt ceiling of five and a half million, uh, meaning that in our general operating budget, how we would be paying for this, um, we would hold ourselves to a conservative uh, debt ceiling of five and a half million. Uh, that number uh, is actually more conservative than some of the numbers that were represented in the five-year forecast, the five-year financial forecast. Um, and uh, we would keep that throughout uh, to both pay for the school debt and any additional debt that may come up along the way. What you see is the red line is the uh, existing debt and the addition of the long-term debt associated with uh, the new middle school project. Um, there are two uh, offsets. Um, one of those offsets, uh, 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 Anthony Soto will speak about uh, very soon, uh, but that's a $500,000 annual contribution that's already been approved by DESE um, to go directly towards uh, the payment uh, of this debt. Um, the other is a fixed amount of $800,000 annually for the first five years, um, and that is based on money that we currently have uh, in the bank set aside, and the mayor is um, committed to um, appropriating that. Obviously, that appropriation isn't something the mayor can do unilaterally. It would have to be done uh, through the normal uh, process with the council, but that's money that exists currently. Um, that we'll be able to uh, dedicate towards this. So what this means is when you look at it, um, our existing debt completely falls off by 2041. Um, obviously, there'll be other projects that come in line, 
but you can see that the difference between the red line and the blue line um, makes up, you know, in some cases, uh, a couple million dollars of additional debt uh, that we would be able to absorb um, on top of the school project and still remain uh, under that five and a half million dollar uh, recommended debt ceiling. And I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Uh, specifically, um, I know that the mayor and Anthony are going to talk about some additional revenue sources because that $40 million uh, could certainly go down uh, prior to um, us taking out any long-term debt. You want to hear the offsets first? Sure. Okay. Um, thank you, Rory. Mm -hmm. would, Mayor, would you like to, Anthony, go into the offsets? Yeah, I think the so the the next slide is about how HPS is is helping, um, and just to remind um, that many of you know because we talk about this often when I'm in the, in these chambers. Um, the the you know the, there has been some talks about like. Why can't the school department just pay for it with their budget? Uh, the net school spending laws only allow you to make capital improvements up to $125,000. Um, so that's just that, that's some of the limitations that come with all of the Chapter 70 revenue that we get. Uh, so within our net school spending budget, we can't do any projects that are above $125,000. So. Um, you know, I, I've been in front of this committee as well, and, and uh, as Rory mentioned, you know, we wanted to get something in writing from the commissioner that talked about approval of the $500,000 um, commitment to, from, the, from the school department, and we were able to secure that this year. Uh, when, we, when it was two buildings, that, that number was a little higher, it was double actually, uh, because we would be realizing more efficiencies and taking more buildings offline. Um, and then, you know, th thank you, Councillor Jordan. The last time I was in here, when we were reviewing the ARPA projects, you you uh, you know pushed my thinking and said, "Hey, like, you guys got ESSER money? Can that go towards these uh, window projects?" So I did go reach out to the state, and they said, "Sure." Like, um, uh, so we I have set aside two million dollars of ESSER money to help pay for the city's portion that would allow us to get. Uh, windows and doors at Lawrence, brand new windows and doors at McMahon, brand new windows and doors at Donahue, uh, partially because a portion of that building has newer windows already, and then a new boiler at Dean. So we've, you know, thank you for pushing my thinking. We went to the state, we got that approved. I've set aside the funding so that that would allow the city to not increase, you know, you're talking about that that blue line that that Rory was talking about, or that orange line, it would allow uh, the city to not have to bond as much for that. So, uh, the mayor has has agreed that two million of it would be out of ARPA. Uh, if once it goes through the process, and then the other two million, Esser will pick it up. So, uh, that was some creative thinking on your part, and I appreciate that. But that's one way that that we've been helping. Uh, to, to do everything that we can to support uh, support this project financially. Great. Thank you. Should I, should I add more? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, we've also been doing what we can to, to, to preserve um, our debt capacity as much as possible, even projects that were previously um, authorized uh, for bonding through vote of the council. We've been um, uh, redirecting using alternate resources, whether if we can do it within our own limit or um, if it's ARPA eligible, redirecting and using that or if it's community development block grants or whatever the case may be. Um, so there is a, a current freeze at any new uh, debt borrowing. Um, uh, it's the last resort, assuming um, there isn't any other opportunity if we have to go forward on a project. And then also just kind of outward thinking, um, a combination of a couple of things. One, the, the um, financial forecasting strategy to help us understand and navigate uh, any potential risk in the, in the near future. 
And then also just kind of the councils and the mayors working together with the forward thinking building capital stabilization so that when new large capital requests do come up, that uh, we can pay for it without having to borrow. So those are just some of the, some of the proactive things that we've been working on um, to limit borrowing as much as possible so that we can do two things. One, afford this project, but also number two, keeping enough um, within our borrowing capacity in case we really do need it for something we just can't handle uh, on our own. Um, uh, and, and what was presented here as far as these numbers are concerned, as the treasurer uh, alluded to, conservative numbers, um, um, and also looking at uh, the 500,000 school districts um, putting forward, as well as you know whatever we put forward in our own uh, local appropriation. Um, there doesn't take into consideration any potential other sources we can tap into as we try to think creatively as much as possible to keep that um, uh, local share from our own budget as low as uh, you know as low as possible. Um, so again, it's 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 worst case scenario being shared with you, but you know taking into account that maybe the project's going to come much lower, we'll get a better interest rate, and then also um, I know there are some things back and forth with the treasurer we've been looking at to help offset the costs um, toward those annual payments. Um, so that, you know, if we were to consider all of those other assumptions, that graph you saw can, can look a, a little more different, if not better than, you know, what it currently reflects. Uh, next slide, I think. <laughs> so, um, this is a little bit potentially head spinning, and I'm glad you guys have hard copies in front of you. Um, this is, you know, uh, having been through this once before, there's been a lot of discussion in this chamber about the meaning of 80% reimbursement. And um, it sounds really simple. <laughs> And this chart is here is really here to explain why it's not really simple. Um, so, in in, an, in a nutshell, and I mean basically, we put the slide into an, in anticipation of this question. So, uh, happy to come back to it. I'll try and kind of give the sort of high level summary. So, the the MSBA, you know, is governed by regulations. They're they're very. Um, by the book about that. And what the regulations say is that communities like Holyoke and like Lawrence, who are our uh, client as well as Mount Vernon groups, and like Chelsea, who are our clients um, for other projects, for other school projects, are at the maximum reimbursement, 80%. And it's, you know, it's a pov essentially a poverty calculation. It's actually a little more complicated than that, but essentially it's reflecting um, the level of wealth in the city. But the thing that people don't always pick up on is that what the language actually says is 80% of eligible costs. And it's particularly focused on the building and site construction. So what I tried to do here, um, working off the total project budget, which is the basis of the, this presentation, in the first column, well, there's the line items that have different funding calculations, right? So the first column tells you what MSBA considers eligible for this project. And it's specific in the sense that um, they have different eligibility calculations for the OPM and architectural fees on a model school project. Um, they um, have kind of typical limits on hard cost and soft cost contingency. You know, the really good news in this column is that the, um, in December, the MSBA raised their cap, which is the, the, the sort of top line, their, ta their cap, what they consider to be eligible, what they are willing to reimburse on the demolition building 
and site cost. So it was, I think, 360, and in December they raised it to 432, and they really changed the way they were calculating it as it relates to site cost. So that is really good news. We are really glad to be doing presenting this to you and to them post December 21st, which I think was the date that they did this, because it does make a difference. However, um, you know, to move on to the next column explains what the cost of this project are. Some of these are coming from the estimates. So for instance, the top line, the 664 square foot, that's coming straight out of the estimate. Um, the others are mostly numbers that I'm recommending to the city based on um, back and forths I've had with Matt Vernon Group. Then the next column gives you the total estimated cost. It calculates what is eligible based on that first column, therefore gives you what's maximum reimbursed. So what you can see is in the last column, kind of this is the bottom line, the reimbursement rate is really different depending on which line item you're looking at. And the, and the real driver of cost um, is, you know, as we would expect, the demo building and site cost. So this is, we're getting more uh, reimbursement per, per square foot um, with this project now than we were for the previous project, but that has been offset by the escalation in construction cost. So, um, you know, I, this is why, I, and I've, some of you have heard me say this before, it's a really good idea to focus on get it, the fact that you are getting $46 million <laughs> than to focus on why it's not 80%, and hopefully this explains why it cannot ever be 80% because this is kind of the playing out of the rules. So that may be more information that you wanted, but hopefully this explains this uh, question that's come up a number of times in the past. So any questions about that before we go on to timeline? I see some I we're good. furrowed brows. I don't dare ask how they come up with the number 432. <laughs> you know, I know that's beyond your scope, Margaret, well, but I, I, one does wonder. It's like saying, you know, I'd really like to buy this new house. And, you know, you tell the person that built the house for you, I'm only willing to pay 432, you know, a mm -hmm. foot for this house. But, you know, Mr. Jordan, it costs 600, uh, excuse me, 664 a square foot. Well, then they're going to say, you don't get the house. Yeah. You know, it, it, I just marvel that they have their own number. It's it's sort of like a budget savings, sort of the way they, they build it into their own system. You know, they I'm, there's got to be a reason how they how they do that. I, I will tell you if you if you have the time it's really worth listening to the December 21st um, MSBA board meeting and actually there was what's called a facilities assessment committee before that and I can actually share the presentations but it when they make these moves it's very hotly debated and, mm. and I will tell you there was a board meeting today and um, they are you know, definitely struggling with the fact that they understand that the escalation of cost has made these projects really difficult for communities. Sean Cronin, who's the, you know, the, uh, represents the sort of economic side of the state and who's on the board, was just shaking his head again today mm -hmm. about, you know, how, the, how far the gap has grown. Right. But I would say their reasoning in brief is that they... They, their money comes from, the, the money that funds the MSBA projects comes from one penny of our sales tax. So every, every dollar of sales tax that's spent in the state, and this was where the Mass School Building Authority was created, different from the, S, the old SBA that some of you may remember. So when the MSBA was created, they created this, this funding mechanism that did not previously exist, but it's also capped by how much sales tax they get. Now, um, the treasurer today on, in the board meeting, I think someone on the board, the Brookline uh, member sort of asked if the legislature is looking at all at, at increasing that. Like they could increase the sales tax <laughs> right. and, and devote that money to this. But right now they have a pot 
right? The number <coughs> of projects is sort of continuing, the, the flow is continuing, and there are challenges that they want, you know, basically to spread the money around as much as possible. So mm. I will say that it's, it sounds crazy, and that if you look, there's a great graph online, the MSBA construction cost data, I would encourage everybody to look at, mm. it's a fabulous chart. The, over time, like the first MSBA project we did, which was a renovation of a high school in Norton, was under the cap. That's right. Yeah. And and since yeah. then, what is what this the is re eligible the eligibility number and the construction cost data have just continued to kind of go like this. So um, it's a it's a big problem. I do think the only real solution to it at this point would be for the legislature to increase the amount of money that's going in the pot. Mm. Um, but that's, in a nutshell, um, kind of the dilemma that they have. I think you anticipated my follow-up question, which is I remember a time when projects were below the cap, Yeah. right? I mean, this wasn't this dynamic of we're only at covering eligible 65% of the true cost. Yeah. That didn't used to always be the case. And well, and in fact, Matt Vernon Group yeah. did the, the Chicopee High Schools, right? So when you, yeah. can you guys comment on where, do you remember where you were when the high school projects happened? Yeah. Uh, Chicopee Turn on your microphone. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That was about 75 million for that. Plus uh, the soft cost, the can I think the total was ninety three million for Chicopee Comprehensive, but that was two thousand five. Two thousand five. Yeah. yeah. I know. It's breathtaking what's happened in the last you know fifteen years. Mm -hmm. okay. The irony of MSBA and the state using one percent of sales tax to fund these their projects is we estimated in times have changed, but maybe 15, 20 years ago, if we took uh, two to 3% of the sales tax out of the Hoyoke Mall, we wouldn't need the state. And yet our taxing scheme yeah. is dictated by the state exactly. to property tax, which nobody wants to deal with. Yeah. And uh, so if we just become our own state mayor and the Hoyoke Mall will support us, or we don't have to do all this. <laughs> well, we all run for office, take over the state house or something. <laughs> okay, there you, go. you can be the governor. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so hopefully maybe that answers some <laughs> yeah. answers some questions that have lingered. So, all right, so I think the next slide is going to lead us into action, hopefully. So um, at the top here, this proposed timeline, this is a very small diagram explaining this approach to the two-phase project and shows you that essentially, you know, we believe we have a quite a good chance if we can follow this timeline of having the project complete for the fall of 2025. But probably most importantly, um, it's proposed to move ahead very quickly and they're embedded in that as a cost savings in escalation, which has really been the driver of what's been made these challenging, these projects so challenging in the last year or two. And then um, just a note that we have a really major um, milestone tomorrow, which is that we're going to submit the schematic design, uh, su make the schematic design submission to the MSBA, the committee, met last night and authorized that submission. And um, the MSBA board will vote um, in June 2021. And if um, the city decides to move forward and, and do their part of the local funding, we would like to be able to begin the school construction in February. So that's it in a nutshell. The next slide, I think, is actually a little bit more important. Um, so just a couple of bullets about uh, timing. So um, I think folks don't always realize that the, the MSBA funding, the schematic design moment is really critical because essentially what happens, we give them the submission, it includes the total project budget. They say, okay, and then they say, we're ready to sign a funding agreement, are you? And so 
they will not sign the funding agreement until you have voted your share of the project. Now, if you think of it from their perspective, it makes sense. Um, they don't want to put invest further costs in the project um, unless they know you're going to fund it. So, for instance, the city might, it, without that rule, the city might move ahead with the design of a project and then decide, oh, we're not going to do it, right? Now, the MSBA is kind of on the hook for something, they just don't do it that way. It's it's the submit schematic design submission, and then the agreement, and then you're funded and you go. And then my job, in partnership with Mount Vernon Group and the building committee, is to make sure that we stay on budget and on time. So that's it in a nugget. Um, why? Um, why the timeline is important. Okay, so vote language is the next slide, which nobody can read unless you have the piece of paper in front of you. Um, I don't know. Oh, Josh, that's it. That's, that's you. the vote language. Vote I, language. I, I there it just, is. I'll briefly speak on that. Fair. Just to say that uh, this language um, has been approved by Lock Lord, uh, who are our bond counsel. Um, they're the the legal team. The city works with any time uh, we have to issue debt. Um, one important thing to note, um, the committee, the school building committee, um, wanted to ensure, uh, in order to protect the city, uh, that knowing the timeline that Margaret just laid out, that the vote on the debt authorization uh, would take place uh, prior to um, the, the award of the grant at MSBA, and while we're all confident MSBA will award the grant, you'll notice um, language towards the end that protects the city, that even if the council authorizes this debt, if MSBA, for whatever reason, decides not to move forward with this project, the authorization is, is, is void at that point. Um, so it's not like the council would vote to authorize this and then MSBA for some reason decides uh, not to work with the city on the project, but the city could still move forward. Um, so that level of protection is in there. And what's really nice is at the bottom, it does speak to the fact that although there's a very large number here, what the city will actually be borrowing will be less the grant that we receive from MSBA and a lot of those cost savings that we're looking to additional revenue sources will help reduce that number uh, even lower. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to actually get Frank and Chris to talk about the building design, which is oh, at the end of the day, uh, the most exciting part, I think, of all of this. So um, we can get a quick uh, little question and answer here on the vote line. Oh, sure. Yeah, R uh, Rory or Margaret, whoever. Um, one is um, it says here at the end that a grant from the MSBA for the project and that the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this vote shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement. Um, so I'm assuming those other grants or these other dollars that you're referencing, the 800 grand a year you're proposing for the cannabis money, uh, perhaps the 500,000 a year from the schools, uh, will the council be provided a copy of the project funding agreement? Yeah, I mean the project funding agreement is a public document, okay. and it's I will also say a standard document. Okay. The most important uh, part of it, as far as you all are concerned, I think is that it's as I said a standard agreement, and attached to it is this total project budget form, this big scary spreadsheet that's you know the, their basis of calculating it. That is in the schematic design submission, mm -hmm. and it can be shared with the council at any time. Yeah, I, I think for us to vote on this, we would need to see that so that all these reference dollars, you know, mm -hmm. the, the state's commitment of a half a million dollars a year for 30 years, that's in the project funding agreement. You know, this money for the cannabis, the 800 grand for five years, this has to be in there. So that these, all these dollars are in the contingencies. Well, I, the, so the funding agreement is with the MSBA for their share 
Um, I th- I'm not sure that you would want to, I'll let Rory take this, but I'm not sure you would want to actually embed in the funding agreement how you're planning to pay for it. Mm-hmm. The funding agreement is really with the, with the state. Should we add it into the vote language if you don't want to add it into the project funding? Because we're making statements in here such that, you know, the city's protected, that the state doesn't not come up with its share. But wouldn't it be also in the city's best interest to say that, um, you know, these other contingencies actually materialize, you know, five years from now, the state says, oh, you know, money's tight and we can't honor that 30 year commitment you know, we made, uh, not that they would do that, hopefully, but... So I'm not 100% certain, but I I think this these this grant language is actually related to other... So um, the MSBA, it, it, their, their process is changing a little bit, but typically if you got other state money, mm-hmm. um, they would... So for the one that's sort of been a standard for a long time is if you got utility rebates, mm-hmm. which are considered a grant, right? Mm-hmm. They would take the savings on the utility rebates off of this. So where I don't know if you know, but I'm not sure that this language is directly referring to the MSBA grant, but I think we could certainly clarify that. Yeah, and, and I would we can certainly clarify it. I would say that um, in addition to Lock Lord, um, the process uh, in order to before this made its way on to the council agenda uh, was MSBA has standard language that was reviewed by the school building committee. The school building committee wanted to include that clause that would protect the city. Mm -hmm. Um, We worked with Lock Lord uh, to put that together. That then had to go back to MSBA. Their legal team had to review it. It then went back to Lock Lord. uh, the the agreement that's referenced here, as Margaret said, is the project funding agreement specific to MSBA. Um, the mechanisms that we talked about, um, you know, we can certainly uh, provide the council with the information that they're looking for, but it's not something that would be included in the MSBA uh, project funding uh, agreement that they envision, um, that they require, and is referenced in this. So, Rory, will there be a subsequent vote in your vision of this playing out that would be a bond authorization? Is that, or is that, or do you view this, this as the bond authorization? This, this, this is the bond authorization. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. So, um, and, and therefore, I guess, um, you know, I would want, I'll consider my thoughts, but at the moment, my present thinking on this is that the council would want to be assured that these representations a future payment are binding on the leadership of the city, i.e., we have a new mayor three years from now, say, and he goes, you know, those last two years of the 800 grand, I got other plans for that money, and uh, I've decided that you know I'm going to go make a new park with it or do new sidewalks or some other meritorious thing, but. It isn't going to this. And, um, you know, we need that all locked down binding. And I, I think we would want to have those representations in here that, like, this is what we're agreeing to, you know, and that this is what the council's basing its vote on. So this language is very important because this is what, you know, we're going to wave in the future that says this is what we're doing. So let's let's just kind of think that through some more. Um, and yeah, the only thing the and and I agree and and I would let the mayor speak to uh, how he wants to authorize it. The the one thing about this language that I just want to be clear on is that this is very specific language that is uh, required under both MGL. MSBA guidance, and it's why we use uh, Bond Council, a separate yep. outside law firm, to, to put this together. So mm-hmm. the addition of anything else to this, mm-hmm. um, we may want to put it in, but the state and Bond Council may say, you're not able to include that in this language. Subsequent uh, information, of course, and agreements the mayor can provide. Yeah, I'm I, I'm just mindful of past legal decisions uh, involving this city that says one mayor cannot necessarily bind the requirements of spending of future mayors, 
and uh, the, those those discussions have taken place in the past and so when we're making these commitments that will be much longer than likely all of us right perhaps when you're talking 30 years um, I just want to make sure all these ducks are in a row that to the extent that we can you know just consider my points and and, and if bond council can work them through um, that would be appreciated. I know, I believe we'll get an updated letter from the, the state. I believe they gave you a letter at one time, right? Yeah, which is really helpful. So, um, okay, I think I've made my point. Yeah, Chair will note that Cinder McNary has unmuted. Cinder, did you want to weigh in on this? Well, I, I do. There's, there's a couple things. I think that um, the offsets that you're talking about, I can appreciate the thinking about, you know, how can you make it so that you can have a guarantee of some sort, but those offsets are to offset debt service, not to offset the authorization here. So I think that the chart that you looked at doesn't reflect those offsets, but what those offsets allow and the timing will allow when we looked at it with the mayor is to smooth out some of the impact of that debt service as it comes on with some of those offsets that are available in either the first five years or through the life of the bond. So um, I have been under the impression that you can't bind a future administration to uh, and a future city council to uh, appropriating things that haven't been appropriated yet. So I think that that is a question for bond council as to whether or not with some of these grant monies that are targeted, that, that offset monies that would be available, what, how you might accomplish that. So that is a bond council question. I do notice one thing missing from this authorization that I think is really important for the city is just the um, approval to request the State Qualified Bond Act to, for this project. And that normally would be included in this language. I'm not sure how it didn't get in here, but if in fact, this goes through a, a couple votes. Is that the process of the, that it gets referred to committee or something like that, and then it comes back? That's a we, question. The bond language is submitted to us, Cinder. Um, we're not anticipating a vote this evening, but we, we certainly want to get into it. Um, we cannot amend any bond language, any appropriations that are put in front of us. We can only refer. But can the can, well can the can something be added that's not in here? We're talking about sure. adding something it, relative to yeah. grants. It, it can be done. It just has to be done through the mayor and the treasurer. And, and oh, okay, so I think yeah. that uh, I think that uh, I mean what it, what that, that program allows, and usually the city always has always issued its debt with that wraparound on the city's credit. It allows the city to sell its bonds. Um, on a, at a, on a, if with the approval of the State Municipal Finance Oversight Board, which it's gotten cons, um, consecutively with its past debt issuance, um, and with its credit rating, it would make sense, is that it would allow the city to sell debt as a, a one notch below the state, which would make it a double A bond instead of the city's uh, rating, which is slightly lower. So it would save a lot of money on the interest rate. Mm. And, but you have to authorize yourself to make that request of the state board. And I think it would be in the vote authorizing this school construction project. So if that comes from, um, you know, the I'm surprised bond council didn't put that in there. So that's something else to check. That's all. What? Those are my only comments. I, I would comment. Glad I, asked I walked through the presentation and the plan of finance here with the mayor and with Rory the other day. And I, I think it's a, a great uh, plan. It makes a lot of sense. There's a number of offsets that if, if they're set aside, and I think there's a way to, to set it aside so that it, it, it can be a constant thing for the city. I think that's <laughs> to check the bond council. But I think that not only does it make sense for the city and show how it can be afforded inside Prop 2.5, I think it makes sense because it doesn't rely on drawing on reserves. And I think the rating agencies, as you do issue the debt for the local share of this over time, I think the rating agencies would respect the plan. And I think right now it looks like a very solid plan. And you've got the capacity to uh, smooth out some of the impact as the existing debt comes off. But as you bring this debt on in pieces to smooth it out with some of the use of the offset monies that are going to be available. Thank you, Cinder. Um, introduced before, but I'll just remind everybody, Cinder McNary is from Hilltop Securities. Uh, she became connected with the city of Hoyoke in 1973, Cinder? 
Yeah. <laughs> I, it's a long time ago. Rory wasn't even in high school in 1973. <laughs> <laughs> a, well, that's good to know. <laughs> jo, Joe was a senior in high school. <laughs> and your mom was a little bit behind me. <laughs> Thank you, Cinder. That, that, that is very important uh, information to have. And I know the mayor's already making notes, and Rory certainly will... Uh, Take the steps to uh, correct the language, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that. But thank you. I think they're going to talk to the design team. Okay, we can get into the. Uh, well, we want to hear the good stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, if, before we start, real quick, joined very important online is our president of city council, Todd McGee, and uh, joined now in person. He was online is Israel Rivera, city councilor, and Tessa, Tessa, and Tessa Murphy Rambaletti has joined online. Thank you. Okay, we'll talk about the site plan first, which is this aerial view that you see before you. <coughs> and to orient you, um, the upper part is Cro uh, Crozier Field, and to the left is Chapin Street, and down below is, excuse me, to the left is Carlton Street, and below is Chapin Street. So you can see how the school, the front of the, um, school will be off of Chapin Street coming down that way and the back of the school which has the gymnasium and the cafetorium which Chris will go over on the floor plans later are up near the Crozier Field and we have direct access to there from from there so you'll be coming in uh, the same driveway that you come in now there'll be a loop road basically around the school and then we have designed all the way down the dingle as well a road coming up from the high school now this is going to be an alternate to the bid for cost saving reasons. We left part of that site design out down at the Dingle, but we will get a price for it. If prices come in really low and you wish to include that, you can do that when the bids come in. So that in a nutshell is the, uh, the way the plan is oriented. And Chris will talk, walk you through the floor plans next. Can Oh, you when do we ask the? Should we wait for our questions oh, can, uh, on uh, each a, page, or do we? Sure, you can ask on the site. You have a question on the site? Yeah, just a couple observations. Sure. Yeah. Uh, one is, me, Kevin. I like the fact that the access road, and I believe that must be going to the high school. Yes. That's been contemplated for a long time. I know. Obviously gated, but yes. uh, oh, of course. Uh, that that that's a good. It thing. It was conceived of, uh, I think, mainly buses to. to yeah, use that. I, I think that's wise. And obviously, um, the school appears to have a smaller overall footprint than the current building, correct? That that's what allows it the does, yeah. parking lot in the back? Yes. Interesting. And in the white shaded over here to the left, mm -hmm. um, that's all current parking that cons is yeah. probably not heavily used always, but is um, part of the pack and is owned by the city. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that's all in white now. What's, uh, why is, why um, is that? I'm not uh, sure where you're referring. Uh, to the far left of far the left. Uh, existing park. So my question oh, oh, is that oh, yeah. city that city land yeah. that's been currently associated with right. PACA, but yeah. not in the... So t tell me about why that's excluded. Um, it's not necessarily excluded. It's just that it was there will be no work done there. I see. You see I mean, it's, uh, obviously you can still use the parking lot if they wish to. Our understanding was that that would, part of it would be used by the YMCA, as they do do now, and other parts of it would be for the school. The YMCA. Oh, excuse me, YWCA. YWCA, yeah. Over the, uh, yeah, they park there. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, so we're giving them our parking lot, or they use, the they, they use it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're not okay. So the parking lot is just going to remain a parking lot. That's though. correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's why. And other than that, the road and and the back all looks uh, comparable to what it is today. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Mayor Garcia, we do 150% agree with you. We all love when it was first presented the road, the dingle. Obviously, if you're born and raised here yes. and you know that area well, it was a great idea. But remember, our commitment was to build what we need the most affordable option available. So we had challenged them a little more and said, what can we get rid of? Right. And uh, I think when, when they talk about their plans, we did get rid of a, a hallway, mm -hmm. um, which they'll get into. And then it was uh, some plants, 
-hmm. And then uh, getting rid of that road saved us a little over $3 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we just thought that was important to note that we were really committed to making sure that we've identified every option possible. Right, right. But if we can make it happen, like the gentleman just explained, we will if the numbers come out lower than anticipated. Yep. Uh, because we all totally we agree with you. We we love that access road connecting to the high school. Yeah, great. It's not the uh, it's not the first time we've talked about this road, which which oh, I no. think it's a okay. great idea. As Randy Collimore can tell you, and probably Whitney too. We, when we added the wing to the uh, the high school, when we did the renovations on the high school, we talked about not only a dingle road, but connecting the road to the lights for the Hoyoke uh, now medical center, then Hoyoke Hospital as a new entrance for both schools. That makes more sense. And Mike Sullivan was mayor, and we, it, it's the, the topography and, and, the, and the difference in the, uh, the, the grade level, I guess, if I'm saying yeah. it correct, so makes that very expensive. So but it want, would be incredible if you could do, yeah. ever do that because it would open up more parking space. Mayor Sullivan wanted an extra practice field for soccer. Yep. You know, these soccer people that became mayor, I don't know where, where they came from, but... But the, it, it's a great concept, and, and I certainly understand costs are, are part of this uh, discussion, but it's something that could uh, prove its weight in gold in the, in the future. Erin? If I may just comment on it further, we could share the design with you that the architects had originally shared with us, and it was so much more than just a road, so that would possibly be busing access, mm, which would yeah. be wonderful, right. um, but very well lit. It would have an additional pedestrian path That's to make correct. it handicap accessible. Mm-hmm. You can see that circle at the end would be um, a tree that they want to reclaim and make like a nice sitting area for reading books. This was a really hard one for me to let go of. I really advocated to try to keep it as possible. So like Chris mentioned, we have it as a bid option. So if the project comes in a few million under budget, which Mount Vernon Group traditionally does, which is again why we chose them, then we could put this back in the project. Um, So we're leaving it, as he said, like a bid option. So we have the option to add it back in only if the project comes in under. Now, of course, if y'all want to include it back into the project, we could just, you know, fund it, fund it, but um, that would be great too. But that's where we're at with that. So just to be clear, that vote authorization number in front of you is less, doesn't have the number, doesn't include the road. Right. Oh, so what I'm seeing is not actually what I'm voting on. Yes. <laughs> well, so that's what we were talking about. So I was trying, we, about, trying to raise my hand. It, it was a little mm-hmm. more than $85 million, Okay. And we how said, much, well, what can we that? get rid of? And But, however, it's an option. Yep. If the bids come back lower than the $85 okay. million, then we'll have some um, flexibility there to actually do it. Do, do you so know what, how much that was? was, it was well, so the, about two million. Two the, million. Yeah. yeah, the estimates uh, 1.8 million. came in at around 74 million, yeah. okay. and we felt that we really needed. Um, our, you know, the recommendation of the consultants to the committee was that they look at several options. So, okay. I think you could call it two million. There were there were a couple of other items, and essentially we were able to take about 2.8 million dollars out. Okay. So the 70.5 million dollar mm-hmm. you're seeing in it. You know, we can certainly send. There's a there's a diagram which essentially takes you know this part of the site and makes it gray. Okay. But you know, as the others have described, I, I don't think anybody wants to do that. Um, we hope um, you know again, sort of consistent with this approach to bidding, that we'll get if we get really good bids, we'll be able to put it back in the project. And there isn't a single member of the committee, right. much less the designers, who don't want to do that. And since this is part of the flow and the buses and all of that, now would state reimbursement be, would this be eligible as an option if we keep it in? So this is where, um, <laughs> to go back to my reimbursement diagram um, and go into the detail. So when the MSBA changed their reimbursement calculations in December, um, they really significantly changed how they're approaching this. Essentially, they're going to give you, and anybody else, $39 a square foot for every square foot of building that you build, okay. which is, yeah, it sort of takes a minute to do that because we're not talking about the building, but it's a way of scaling the amount of money mm-hmm 
of, that they're going to give you for site costs mm -hmm. to the size of the building you're building, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. they're all it's always proportional, which is something I think they've struggled with as from an act, as an equity calculation over the years. So um, Frank and Chris, help me here. I think the site costs were around let's call it $10 million, yeah, 10, yeah. they're going to give you about 4.4. So the, you could think about this as that this, this piece of it is already outside. They're not going to give you any money on okay. it. Whether you, whether you keep it in or keep it out, it's above the cap. I see. So you don't have to think about that as being a factor in this. Okay. 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 Does that sound right, guys? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. But I'm glad you made that a priority because that's important. Thank you. It was a, it was a tough. It was a really tough call. Um, but like we said, we had to look at it like, does it impact our education plan? And it right. doesn't. Right. So we wanted to present you guys the most affordable package that obtains the goal mm -hmm. of providing the most quality education possible. This is a quality of life. And I would love to see it put back in, but it, you know, ultimately doesn't affect the quality of the education, mm -hmm. which is our main goal, right? So if it was a potential to help the project be more affordable, then mm -hmm. you know, I, we compromised. Okay. Okay. Um, before you on the screen is uh, the first floor plan of the model school. Uh, this is a very efficient plan. It addresses all the spaces needed by the educational requirements for the district. It's broken down into two grade neighborhoods. On the lower portion is the sixth grade. On the upper portion will be the seventh. They're very identical, which provides easy wayfinding as children move from grade to grade. The yellow uh, spaces are general classroom spaces. The blue are special education spaces, which you can see are spread out through the entire floor plan. To the right, there's some brown areas which are the administration near the front entrance of the school. The shape of this model school creates a courtyard in the middle. It does two things. One, it allows natural light and ventilation into all the classrooms on the inner portion of that donut. And two, it creates a usable space by the school, an outdoor learning space. In this uh, particular plan, there's a seating area for lectures and learning classroom type activities. There's a, a grassed area, if you will, for additional outdoor activities, um, such as reading, et cetera. And then there's some planter boxes that students can use to participate in their science programs, grow herbs and vegetables that may or may not be used in the cafeteria. The second floor plan is identical to the first in the classroom layout. It's broken down into basically two classroom wings again, with um, at the top and bottom. So at the top is the eighth grade classroom, very identical to the seventh grade below with science classroom and sports spaces. The lower portion are some of the common spaces utilized in the school. For example, the media center and library, uh, the art room, the world language classroom. There's occupational and physical therapy rooms. There's a fitness and weight room, and then the nurses suite. To the left is the common spaces and community spaces, which would include the gymnasium. The cafeteria has a, a stage platform. The music room is at the back of that area. And then towards the very rear in the gray would be your custodial and support space mechanical rooms. The layout of this plan is such that to the left of that com common or community space, that abuts Crozier Field. So for PE classes, students can go outside and use the field as well as the community. There are some hardscape spaces out there as well that was shown on the floor plan that would include basketball hoops and things of that nature for both the community and school use. To the right side of the plan are some vocational or consumer science programs that are also part of, and technology, that would be part of the district's education program. What's nice about the plan is it's very compact. The spaces, classrooms, and support spaces are very flexible. So they support the educational program not only today, but as that program evolves over time, the schools last minimum 50 years. So as the district sees their program evolve through the years, those spaces will evolve as well and can outfit and, and accommodate the program changes. 
If you go to the next page, I'll show you an example of the front entrance. Um, very resilient um, materials, easy maintenance, brick, cast stone veneers. The color selections we'll be reviewing with the school committee. And one of the things to note that we met not only in discussion with the school building committee, but the school's educational advisory group, which consisted of teachers and staff administration. So everybody's had a chance to look at this, provide input, and these are the kind of final um, layouts that ha we've come up with to meet the school's educational program. And then on the next slide gives you a perspective of how that building would sit on the site. Centrally located, providing parking pretty much on both sides in the front, a welcoming main entrance, separate parent and student drop off, and then, like I said, co convenient access to Crozier Field at the, at the rear. Any questions on the plans? Councilor Jordan. I, I had one roof question actually, which was, um, I'm assuming because it's a model school, you have to stay with exactly pretty much what it is. But I, I wanted to ask, is it in terms of your experience or, or people who are obviously, and Whitney I know would be much more well versed in this than I would be, but I hear things about the long term survivability of these flat membrane roofs versus actually having you know a nice architectural pitched roof um what what's what's the thoughts on that in terms of its overall durability yeah. sure yeah. Yeah. Uh, i think it's 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 kind of a misnomer it's not really a flat roof because the steel is sloped to interior drains okay so it's always at a pitch right and what's important about having interior drains rather than you know, uh, gutters and, and downspouts around it, interior drains are always warm because they're inside the building. So the water flows freely and you don't get that kind of icing up and things like that that happen. So in many ways, uh, if it's done correctly, mm -hmm. which you know, it takes a, both the design and the construction to do it right, mm -hmm. you get free flowing uh, uh, drainage throughout the entire roof. So it's not really flat. You know, because okay. the structure, it, see, in some cases, what they would do is uh, taper, taper insulation to the drains. Mm -hmm. See, that's not long lasting because, you know, you have, then you would have a flat roof. But these are the, the steel is actually pitched in okay. various places around the, the roof. So. so the life of this type of a roof compared to, you know, a regular, more traditional pitched roof yep. would be? The same. The same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think you can. Done, done in terms correctly. of maintenance and yeah. cost. There have been a lot of bad roofs both pitched and, and flat over the years so uh, cool. you have to be very careful with roofs right and, uh, and that's important though we always felt right in the beginning we work with the structural engineer to make sure everything is pitched you know I think there's also been a really big change in the industry which mm -hmm. is that now when you specify a roofing membrane the manufacturer the roofing membrane takes on the responsibility of also doing inspections. They certify installers, and they, they take a role in their warranty. They mm -hmm. basically provide oversight. This is, a, a, you know, I would say past 10 years, sort of change in the way roofing is done. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to also put in a plug for the fact that another thing that the city gets in the situation from um, funding through the MSBA is the MSBA provides what's called a commissioning agent for the project, which is someone who provides another level of oversight. So you could sort of think of, there's a sort of stack. So there's the, um, the manufacturer's warranty. The manufacturer mm -hmm. is providing oversight of the installation of the roof. Right. The architects are providing oversight of the installation of the roof. Mm -hmm. the, our clerk, so we have a full-time clerk on site, is providing installation, and then the MSBA has a commissioning agent who is also looking at the installation of the roof. So, you know, for instance, they'll, they will provide thermal scans of the roof that will look and see if there's water, if there's water, and sort of be able to check at the time. So, it 
I, I understand why people feel this way, but I personally, I feel like the industry's changed a lot in the last 10 years, okay. and I agree with what uh, Frank and Chris are saying about okay. this. So. Okay. It's also a good platform for uh, solar voltaic you know, uh, right. panels. Yep. Um, what, which raises the question of, you, you mentioned warranty. Do, does, is there a warranty that comes with the building? Yeah. I Do mean, you know how long that is? Well, it's you guys, what would you guys specify, 25 well, years? A statutory one-year warranty on everything that the general contractor has, and that goes through all the subs. On top of that are the uh, manufacturer's warranties for the many, many different products that are there. So we, we turn over all those manuals at the end of the project. Uh, you know, like, for example, you want to get at least a 20-year warranty on your membrane roof. Right. And uh, they usually last longer if they're maintained properly. Uh, but there, and that includes all the equipment that's used. So everything has its own uh, uh, manual that goes with it, both for the use of the equipment and for its uh, warranty. Okay. I have some other questions, but I want to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Councilor. Aaron. If I may, I just wanted to point out some of the, Margaret had briefly talked about, you know, we took out a hallway and different things. So <clears throat> some of the other things that we did to save costs is if you look at that first floor layout, um, there was a corridor that connected the back side of the building where say the gym is upstairs, but not on the main floor. And so we eliminated that corridor because you can just go up the stairs. You don't have to go across. And now if you want to go across, you can go outside through the terrace or you just go around in the U. So that saved a little bit of money. We looked into options of narrowing the hallways to reduce square footage, um, but ultimately decided against that because in one of our surveys, students and family members really, really want lockers. So we're ensuring that we keep the space adequate for lockers. Um, and then, so I just wanted to point that out while we were looking at floor plans, um, that white space that's like borders what would signify, signify, signify thank yeah. you, <coughs> The gym we eliminated. Um, so those are just some of the little things that we, once we did go out to bid, we looked at to see like even how can we bring this closer to budget. Good. Good question. Councilor Rivera. Um, the gym in the cafeteria, the wall that's there, I saw in the video, is that soundproof? Uh, yeah, the sound attenuation, yeah. It, it's both soundproof and impact proof because you have... Uh, you know, basketballs and things going up against it. So yeah, they're pretty, pretty. So good. how far away from like the out of bounds line is the wall? Oh, it's it, the full court is within the wall. It will, uh, you'll have full runoff area for the court on, uh, at that end. Because right, in the picture, it kind of looked kind of close. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, minimum would be at that end uh, on the basketball court, I think it's 10 feet from the, from the end line, yeah. All right, thank you. So it's runoff area. And then it's a it's a padded surface, so you can run you know run into it. You know, I just want to add. I I think Erin Linville has let you all know, but there is another upcoming visit to the Goodnow School. So if any of the city councilors want to go see the Goodnow School, it it is it's Next like week. Back to the Future, basically. If you Friday. it's May second. May second. May second. Yeah. Next Tuesday. Am I doing that one? I'm going to, I guess I'm being, I'll be the host. <laughs> Anthony? Yeah, I just, I, I really wanted to just take not even a minute to, to thank the council for all of your support. I've been working here in Holyoke for um, just about seven years now. And, and in, in that short time, uh, through the support of the council, we've been able to invest over $17 million um, into you know, various window projects, boiler projects, and, um, you know, despite everything that has gone on with the other project, like, I just want to acknowledge that you, you guys have been really supportive of, of the schools, and, and, and you know, we, we do have old facilities, and we do the best we can to, to maintain them, and without your support, that, that would not have been possible, and I just hope that, that um, you know, you continue to, to support our efforts to, to make sure our learning environments are are well suited for, for, for our students. Um, the, the only thing left is the appendix. I think it kind of speaks for itself. Okay. It's just, in, it's informational. Yeah. 
Uh, I believe that concludes the presentation, right? Yeah. That's it. Presentation is concluded. Does that mean Q&A, Mayor? Q&A. <laughs> Q&A. Some of the questions on behalf of ourselves and some of the questions we've been asked on behalf of others to, uh, to ask. But I'll recognize Councilor Jardine first. We'll get the easy part out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have uh, actually w one other thing. Again, uh, I'm glad you guys envisioned the road. I, I was actually going to ask about that, and you're already right on top of that. I wanted to ask you about Crozier Field. You know, one of the things, one of my takeaways from when we did the um, renovation to the high school and when we did the previous to that, the renovations at the football field in particular, was that if we had married those two projects together, so it was told to me at the time, that the field project would have been eligible for MSBA reimbursement. If you do the fields and that type of work at, as part of building a school, and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that you know you build a school and here's the baseball field and here's the playground for the kids and the jungle gyms and you do all this outside stuff as part of the project that that would have been eligible for reimbursement. And so the question I want to find out is one, is that true? And then number two is if it is true, then is this the time for us to consider improvements to Crozier Field as part of the educational experience at the risk of increasing costs. But if we can get a multiplier effect where 50% of some of these important improvements so that the kids have a nice, a nicer baseball field, soccer field, different things that we could do at Crozier to do upgrades at Crozier mm -hmm. as part of this school project, um, is that an opportunity for the city that you know, we'll be kicking ourselves 10 years from now, then we said, boy, you know, we should have made those upgrades because I got to envision, you've got this beautiful field next to this school that the kids at PAC are going to want, are going to be using that field. And mm -hmm. the question is, you know, is that, is this going to be a missed opportunity if we don't do all these things at the same time where, yeah, it might be an extra <clears throat> 5 million, but we could have saved maybe two million of it if we mm -hmm. did it now versus 10 years from now. So I wanted to just add that to the discussion and get your thoughts. Yeah, I think from my understanding, the fields at the high school are school property where Crozier Field is not school property. So Crozier Field is city park lands. So I don't think that that would qualify, but I mean, if I'm mis but, Well, there's, so there's a yeah. short answer and a long answer. And then Frank, I'll, I'll let you um, add your piece. So. I mean, the short answer is you remember when then I was talking about how the MSBA had radically changed their mm. formula. Mm. I, I think this is why. <laughs> this kind of thinking is why. So um, it used to be that the calculation was basically they'd give you 8% of the construction cost as site cost. Mm. And so you can imagine if you didn't have a lot of site costs and you wanted to do some other stuff, and you could get under the 8%, you'd get reimbursed, right? But that's now it's like, it's a really like a hard cap. You have $105,000, 106,000 square feet of building, you have 39 bucks, 4.4 million. That's your cap. Like you can spend more. Um, so that's one answer. The, the longer answer. And that's basically for the, when you say the 4 million number, you're referring to anything to do with the outside of the building effectively. Correct. Outside the four walls. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And again, it's just uh, take 106,000 and multiply it by 39, you get that number. So I guess it's more like, it's, yeah, it's a little over 4 million. Right? Okay. Um, the, the other, the, the, the more complex piece is that it is a true statement that you have a site contractor and a general contractor are going to be on the site. We had a project a number of years ago, well, the Norton High School I mentioned, they actually were doing a debt exclusion, and they had on the debt exclusion um, a separately funded town project to improve the adjacent <coughs> fields, and then they had the MSBA project, and they had the two votes. And then they were able to have one contractor do both, which produce a, gen a general conditions. The cost of the contractor on the site was actually reduced mm -hmm. for the, the field work, mm -hmm. but it couldn't be 
funded together through the MSBA. Mm -hmm. So Frank, did you want to add something? No, that, that covered it. Yeah, it was just that you're capped. You know, you, you can do it. This is a relatively newer rule, though. This, no, I, or I this think, formula, um, or it's no, it's a good point. I, it, the rules were a lot different before MSBA. Right, and, uh, right, they, right. They yeah. used to give you your true eighty percent. Right, and, right. Um, it's unfortunate, but uh, this is the it is the Department of the Treasury, so they're always looking for ways to save money. Right, right. But okay. um, you know, it's unfortunate, but nothing. I would stop you from doing that on your own, of course. Right. But you know they're not they're not going to participate. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So um, I'll move over to the maybe some of my Aurori questions or whoever else wants to field this, but they're in the realm of the, the obviously the finances. So I uh, looked at the chart. Um, we have to come up with a $2.75 million annual bond payment if we're going to do this on 30 years based on the current estimates. And 500000 is going to come from the schools for five years. Um, the the 800,000, I believe there's like $3.7 million sitting in that, so it's not quite 800, maybe 750 um, per year would come from uh, that fund for five years. And that means for the first five years, we would be roughly a little under a million and a half per year. And then after that, that would spring up to like two and a quarter million a year, right? Um, okay. So the question is, now these payments would start in fiscal year 2027, right? I believe I read. Correct. Okay. So um, one of the nice things is um, that if we get, so the, the payments for the cannabis money would start then, correct? Would be in those, so 2027 right. through either 2031, 32, something in that realm. Okay. So if we stay on the current schedule um, for the, like I'm thinking about how does this fit in the context of all the other things that are going to be going on? Because we have to fund this and make sure that we don't run the well dry for everything else that we need to do. So I guess what I want us to consider is what are all those other things, mm -hmm. right? So we know currently, based on what the retirement board, they created this new escalating ladder through 2033, which says 300 more, 600 more, 900 more, a million two more. I mean, it's a pretty aggressive schedule for the next uh, whatever number of years that is, 10, 12 years. Now, the good news is we get pretty close to that with the, with the 800,000 payment. So that'll help. Um, but this is going to be quite burdensome to the budget um, to get us fully funded for our retirement. We have OPEB that's sitting out there for $310 million, which conceivably we're supposed to do something with that between now and 2040, right? Um, and we have sewer projects. We have all the other things. I'd like to see if you guys could lay it out. I don't know if you speak to what your assumptions are as to the everything else because what I want to do and again I want to get to yes I really want to vote for this um, the thing I should say at the outset not a question but more of a comment is I so much more appreciate this approach that you guys have taken in all of this I think your committee was um, really took to heart the points that were made from a lot of different diverse voices in the city um, to try and have a committee that was uh, reflective of all those voices and considered all this the whole approach of you know how do we work together and, and get there I think that's better this time I think that will well serve you this time around um, and considering cost as a factor and in light of you know the total demand on the community financially right because um, we all want the same thing like I said previously I think I've said this to the mayor before that and I, I know Joe and Peter, as long-serving members here, would know. Some of the easiest votes we would take was doing things for the schools. Because the old days was, you know, with the whole formula went right up. You're getting 80. At one time, you used to get 90%, right? So 10%, I mean, that's an easy vote, right? I get this big, wonderful, beautiful thing, you know, like the additions that we did um, at the elementary schools. And, you know, we would pay 10%. 
how, how do you say no to that, right? I mean, we, th- these were these would go flying through here, these votes, right? And then it became this new formula, right, where it's like 50-50. So, and these things got expensive. So this is where it got tricky. But I, I really do want to uh, compliment the committee and the approach and the reach out and all the legwork you've done in advance of that. That really is a compliment to, to each and every single one of you. So what I want us to... Um, be sure is that we don't have a situation and I want to be able to say to the voters and to the to the people that we represent here that we're not setting the city up so that five years from now it's not a debt exclusion for the schools but we need a tax override because we can't do trash pickup because we don't have the money anymore in the budget. You know, there's no liquidity in the budget or we're not going to have money for the police department because, you know, we used all the money here to pay for this and this, but now we don't have money to fund this school. So what I really want us to do is really as best as we can build in this level of conservatism and map out these different things that we know are happening and show Look, people of Holyoke, we can afford this $2.75 million for the next 30 years. And here's exactly how we can do it based on all of our reasonable estimates of these different things that are going on. Because if you show that, we're, we're golden, right? I mean, you've already said we're not going to do a tax override, which the people cannot afford. And I think they spoke pretty loud and clear on that. Um, but, you know, I just want us to show that we're not setting the city up for future troubles and um if we can do that i mean i think we're in a really good place you know i would feel comfortable you know because i think everybody says hey you know you guys are the educators we we, we want to do things with the schools i mean i would push the envelope even more with the state in terms of a low interest loan you know obviously it helps i'm glad cinder made the point about using the state's bond rating for us to save money on that interest rate, hopefully that gets us better than five and a half percent, which would shave this number down uh, considerably. But you know, when they're sitting on billions, literally, you know, what's it for them even to say, "Hey, Holyoke, you need this forty million. We'll let you borrow the forty million, and we'll give you a two percent interest rate on this thing." Right? Why can't they do that for us? You know. Why can't they do that for us? I mean, they're running the schools. Um, we'll pay it back, but just those type of things could save us a ton of money, right? So if you, can, <laughs> if they can pass something special, I'm just throwing that out there. You oh, know, if that's a Rep. Yeah. Duffy, Senator Vialis thing where they could earmark $40 million for a bond for Holyoke at 2% interest with the state, gee, that would be awesome. You know, um, that, that could save us some money. So I did want to throw that out there. But... Um, Basically, that's that's my point. I think we owe it to all involved to feel comfortable, to the auditor, to everybody around that has to look at the projection. And I know if this was my money, my personal money, I would say, okay, what are all the reasonable things that can happen mm-hmm. to me? What's my emergency fund? What's all of these things? You're building in this level of conservatism in it that maps this out, that sets, okay, you know, because one of the things the city got cited for, um, in and I, I report to the the Moody's point was, you know, we actually have really low debt service here in the city, but the concern is that when we talk about excess capacity, that's because we have considerable deferred maintenance. Like I pointed out in the Moody's report, it says that, you know, you're at eighty uh, percent depreciated. That means you're almost to salvage value, right? So the, this community, in order to be healthy as and, and provide the quality of life our residents expect, over this next 30 years, we need to do a school, but we also need massive infrastructure improvements in parks and roads and sidewalks. We need the liquidity to be able to show that we can do those things, and that is built into this model. So I want you to consider those points, and let's maybe have a follow-up conversation about building that, and then we can show, hey, this is a future, this is our Holyoke 30-year roadmap that we don't know what all of those things in, but we're, we make estimates to say, you know, we think that it would be these possible things, and yet we also know we have this debt service dropping off, 
but we know we're going to need these other things. So if all of these, and then we build in a five or ten percent contingency on top of that, shows you know we have a healthy margin that over the next thirty years we can afford this. We can afford to to make the sewer improvements that we need, and the water improvements, and the sidewalks, and all these other things, and start contributing to these other big time expenses like fully funding our retirement program which we're required to do and um, starting to address OPEB you know which we're at some point we're going to be required to fund and um, the future councils and mayors will be feel like boy these guys took a long-term approach they weren't short-sighted like yeah go ahead fund the money now but you know 10 years from now we got a real problem and um, so th that was basically my point. I really wouldn't get a good concrete financial plan on this and how this fits into it. And if we can do that, yeah, I'm, v I'm very warm to doing this. And I've already expressed that to you privately that, you know, um, we, we really would like to move forward if we can afford it. Thank you. Mayor. I think, Councilor, you're speaking my language there a little bit. Um, a lot of what you just talked about is simple financial planning, financial forecasting, and capital planning. Actually, the graph that was put together um, was um, uh, uh, helpful uh, by the uh, financial forecast model that the Kinshrift team put together, and that's an ongoing development tool as new revenues get realized, as more numbers and figures get populated, and, um, and you'll see that develop more over time. The capital planning part um, is a little bit more um, extensive, um, which we plan on on doing. It's, it costs money to do a capital plan, and a little frustrating when you can redirect three hundred thousand dollars and actually get some capital stuff done. But that's how much it costs to develop such a plan. However, um, we have about six seven million dollars worth of capital projects that's about to kick off very soon um uh in all of our public buildings um so we're going to be t we using um the available arpa resources and so uh, uh, the reason why we were able to keep um our bond rating of a plus um is because of a lot of the strategies that were put in place to better navigate risk uh, um i think that in time um as we continue to do the work that we've been doing um we're going to get better and better in developing those tools to help us uh, better forecast out, plan for those capital needs as they appear, whether if planned or as needed when emergencies happen. Um, uh, you know, and as we develop those strategies and those tools um, and and those systems that we're also acting very aggressively. Thanks to, again, thanks to this startup money that we have, this ARPA money, five million of it in the first tranche was already committed. We got the OPM um, uh, working with the team and, and I think, and, and Rory can speak a lot of, because he's been following this project, a, a lot of what's gonna be happening in a very short uh, time period from today. Um, uh, so that we are acting on those deferred long-term, those, those deferred maintenance that hasn't been taken care of for a very long time. We're talking about the annex, the DPW building, City Hall. Um, there's some plans for the War Memorial um, among, I think that's the public buildings that I have. The top of my mind. Hall. Is that it? Yeah. Um, so short and long term on in the interim, tackling those with what we have, um, taking advantage of this opportunity while on the long term, we continue to strengthen our financial forecasting model and develop our capital, uh, or essentially our capital plan. We do have a capital plan of what we know what we need done, but we're talking about a conditions report, something much more um, uh, comprehensive that really helps determine what the, how many years a roof has left um, before it goes or and, and what year that needs to be replaced in your five year or 10 year um, capital improvement model. Um, so yeah, I, I you, you know, we're, we're already heading in that direction. It isn't anything that I don't think we can produce, um, you know, within a week or anything, but it's, it's, it's things that we're actively pursuing and, and working on. But um, 
Rory, if you want to add some more yeah. thought into this, because we've been working a lot together on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and as, as a counselor, you know, <clears throat> this is something we all share, uh, right. this desire. Um, just to elaborate a little bit on what the mayor was saying, so we, we, we recognize that what we truly need as a city is a long-term capital needs assessment. That's something the city hasn't done possibly ever. The needs um, assessment, yeah. yeah. So uh, that is something, but that's a multi-month, possibly 12-month process. Mm. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the mayor has uh, allocated, actually it was Mayor Murphy uh, that allocated the first tranche uh, of five million um, for uh, the municipal buildings project and Mayor Garcia uh, is reviewing applications now uh, for the next tranche and potentially will be allocating more. Um, but what's even more exciting and, and something that is somebody that's uh, been paying attention uh, to the city's finances for a long time, something that I've always wanted to see is a capital stabilization fund, mm -hmm. uh, which is something this council uh, created mm -hmm. and and the mayor and uh, the auditor were able to dedicate um, free cash to and something that I think is gr a great illustration of how that capital stabilization fund is already having a benefit for this project is in the past other projects uh, accelerated repair or, or core projects such as this when you go out to do schematic design, uh, that's something that we may actually borrow for. We may borrow, we'll get reimbursed, but we're paying an interest rate on that. Well, this time, because of the wisdom of the mayor and the support of the council, we were able to dedicate capital stabilization funds to the schematic design for this. And so what that means is not only are we not paying any additional uh, interest on that, once we receive the reimbursement, we'll be able to roll that back into either this project or another project or possibly, you mm -hmm. know, to fix up the field, the crozier, um, you know, any of those types of things. So I think that's a, a great demonstration of, of what we're able to do. And I'd also say that, um, you know, once the council authorizes any debt, it, it doesn't mean the money's going to be spent right away. Um, and, you know, we do authorize debt on behalf of the water department, uh, as, as the council knows. Mm -hmm. And uh, a great example, to your point, uh, Councillor Jourdain, is, you know, the council had authorized, uh, over the course of a couple different votes, uh, a large amount of money uh, to make uh, water improvements in, right. in the city uh, to that vital water infrastructure. And when that authorization happened, what through the work of, of Cinder at Hilltop and, and, and other folks, I, I wasn't here at the time, I've, I've just kind of helped close out some of this stuff since I've been here, was they were able to actually take advantage of some state um, low interest rate loans uh, to help offset that. So part of that authorization actually was able to reap that benefit. And so that kind of creative um, review that can happen over the course of projects, I mean, some of that debt uh, was authorized six years ago, and we're just now uh, doing the borrowing on that. So it, it, it does take a long time, but we're constantly looking for those cost savings um, to achieve that uh, long-term financial sustainability. And, and the last point that I'll mention, uh, just to reiterate what the mayor said, is the uh, assumption here, especially the recommended debt ceiling, is directly from uh, the five-year financial forecast and even a, a lower number than what they were thinking we could afford. Mm -hmm. um, not saying, uh, you know, that we're going, they expect it to be more, that it's, this is what you can afford if you uh, add all this additional debt. And we said, you know what, let's keep that even lower because of other budgetary uh, stressors, such as retirement, OPEB liability, and right. so on. The only thing I'll say, in, uh, and I'm gonna end on this point, is we, I know 
this could get really comprehensive and what you're planning is fantastic. But since this vote has to take place in the next four to six weeks, as best as we can put this together in the next month, and even if we have to use some assumptions for the future, then we do that so that we, the 13 of us, can feel comfortable that this is viable financially for the city to go forward and have a plan that you both sign off on that says, you know, council, we can afford this. This is how we're considering this, which is important, and all the other needs of the community. Um, and if we have that put together, then we can feel comfortable to vote for we'll, this. We'll, we'll be able to put something together for Thank the committee's you. review prior to your next meeting. Excellent. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You just add a couple of things to the uh, discussion. Um, Police headquarters is great. Fire headquarters is great. New fire station, Whiting's Farms Road is fine. Homestead's okay. We got to stop putting band aids on Northampton Street. So that building has to get into the uh, equation here because I think there's a whole there's a whole plan for Northampton Street. What's that? There's a whole plan. You're talking about the condition of the road? No, fire, the fire station. Fire station. Oh, the fire station. Yeah. Is that okay. station three? Station yeah, three. There's, station there's, there's three, been some yes. work happening up there. Yep, and yeah. and it is it's part of the existing municipal buildings project scope, <laughs> and we expect to add additional projects uh, to help that. But I I could not agree with you more. Um, yeah. uh, former Chief Pond gave me a tour of that and all of the facilities at yeah. one point a number of years ago, and it is. Uh, it's not right the it's way sinful. that building is, yeah. and it does need to be fixed. And it is not just on right. a list, a spreadsheet, but there's actually money being allocated yeah. for I it. I just want it in the equation because yeah. yeah. that, that's to me is a key. To uh, our superintendent, student population when we started all this a handful of years ago was projected at middle school 1,100. Are we still in, at that number? Yeah, just about. So the, the school's. Um, looking to be built for about 550 we're a little below the 1100 but um you know I, I, the experience that we've heard is i was going to say six or seven hundred but that's okay <laughs> the experience that i've heard Up of two. in the in the past is that you know you build a new school so you know it starts to attract i think middle schools especially is where um where we tend to lose a lot of our families you know uh you know, the, a lot of a lot of families that that choose to go to private school um, end up coming to Holyoke High. Um, you, you don't have to sell me on the on why we're doing this at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I I'm in favor. I I was in favor of the two schools because the two schools is only dividing the one school for 1,100 kids yeah. into two. But the reason I was in favor of it, this is where my question is going, is after getting the middle school kids out of the elementary school you know, the consolidation of at least two elementary schools was gonna happen. In the long term, that's a big budget plus. W what are we looking at with building one school and what's gonna happen to the rest of our uh, school buildings? Yeah, so we already, through rezoning, we were able to, uh, not two facilities, one facility, which is PEC, where we're looking to do, we, we were able to get PEC and Holyoke Middle School students and spread them out through the rest of the district. Uh, once this building is is built and, and moving ready, um, our plans would be to not need the the Metcalf School building there. Uh, right, temporarily for the next couple of years, we're gonna have a middle school at Metcalf um, and we're gonna still have a middle school co-located in the Dean campus. Um, Dean has been on the rise uh, Dean, you know, when I when I first came in here, we had about 150 students there. Um, it was really, really struggling um, and happy to report that, you know, we, we have about 140 kids on the wait list that want to get into Dean. But because we don't have the space and we have a middle school there, um, you know, we're not able to do that. So we'll be able to get the, the students, about roughly uh, 250 students out of um out of STEM Middle School, which is the Dean campus, and we'll be able to get uh, about 200 students out of Metcalf, and those students would be moving into the new uh, facility, and then there won't be a need for um, for the Metcalf Middle School building. We'll be able to close okay. that, and um, also wanted to 
mention that you know we were renting the building right next to it um that, that which that's automatically uh, uh you know well over a hundred thousand dollars in savings we're not going to be renting that building anymore and as you know with rent with rent that that's above the net school spending so even with the rezoning we've already made some some um you know closing the the metcalf middle school that's next to the metcalf building and then when we build this we'll be able to close the metcalf so metcalf will get closed but the other five elementary schools will stay open um yeah i believe it's six 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 yep because we have three feeding into one middle school and three feeding into another middle school okay. when this when this uh, the rezoning plan is, is finalized with the co construction of this new building. And, and I think along the same lines, and I know Whitney's over there, and uh, along the same lines, we need to know, are these six elementary schools going to need replacement or work in this I think uh, through years? your support, the last time we were here, you know, um, you know, we were here for ARPA, uh, for... Um, ARP projects to get new windows and doors at Lawrence, new windows and doors at McMahon. I think that does a lot. Um, we, you know, I don't, I don't know that we're going to be looking to replace those buildings in the near future. But that's um, well, you know, Lawrence was built as a bomb shelter. That's not going anywhere. I'm more yeah. worried about Morgan and and yeah, Kelly. Morgan's and in good shape. You guys, you guys, with your approval, we put new windows and doors in there. The building was, is in really great shape. We got some uh, projects in the summer to improve some of the outdoor spaces there. Kelly's in great shape. Um, the rest of our the, the rest of our elementary schools are in pretty good shape. I would say Metcalf is Metcalf and Lawrence are our oldest ones, and probably you know the ones that that you know. That, that that are the oldest and uh, but but we're making some investments in Lawrence hopefully within the next couple of years that'll bring that that school to a much uh, better learning environment with more natural light okay and my, my final question because I think it's you talked about middle schools and the attraction to parents preschool what are we looking at for preschool future yeah are so we... we've uh, we've doubled the number of preschools uh, seats in the last <laughs> seven years um, I'm telling you, so I say this because, like, next year we are going to be tight. I'm not going to, you know, with rezoning we cl and closing PEC and re relocating PEC students and Holyoke Middle students, all of our schools are going to be closer to capacity than they've ever been. Um, you know, with, with declining enrollment, there's, you know, um, you, you, there, was, there was space to spread out, but our, our schools are going to feel a little tighter than they have been. But... Um, you know, we don't have our students sitting in modulars while this construction is happening. We, we were able to fit all of our kids within our portfolio, which I think is an amazing feat um, in rezoning. Sometimes when you're when you have to do new construction, your, your students are sitting in a, in a parking lot in a modular in modular <laughs> classrooms. And we're not we're not having to do that. Um, I, one thing that, you know, I, I would say, like I said, pre-K is tight, but we're, we're, we've you know, we're. We we don't need, we haven't even filled all the seats that we have available for pre K, um, and if if there is a growing need for more pre K, um, then one option that the city could explore is is not shutting down Metcalf at that point and and instead keeping it as a pre K center that would that would allow fourteen more classrooms down the road that we could open up if if that if. That was the, the desire of the, of the community for sure. Um, our plans right now is to stay with the amount of pre-K classrooms that we have. I'd love to be able to convert more of, of the half-day programs into full-day programs because families really like that option a lot better. Um, but those are some options that we could we could have in the future. Peter Tallman told me he'd like to see Metcalf become his retirement home. <laughs> <laughs> so don't uh, don't think you're keeping it open with that in mind. Yeah. Last question, energy to heat the building. What are we using? Air, air source. Uh, right now we're looking at. Um, Get the mic uh, what, what did we find? Yeah, it was on the way. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can go ahead, Chris. And you, you were working on that. So, so we're we're working with Whitney and his group. Um, we have an 
electric air source heat pump currently designed for it with alternate for dual fuel. So I believe we're working with uh, the Holyoke Gas and Electric to talk about different options, make it most efficient for the school system. Um, obviously, we're looking to populate the roof with photovoltaic panels to supplement the electrical uh, output and uh, energy for the school. Is there any chance of natural gas? There is. Dual yeah. source, yeah. They, okay. that, that's what the goal is. Not off the table. Yeah. Not off the table. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think um, the, the estimate is based on a con the conservative, more expensive assumption that it's all electric, with the understanding that based on a sort of more detailed analysis of the gas capacity <clears throat> and conversations with Holyoke Gas and Electric, they could go to a hybrid system. There just wasn't sufficient time within the schematic design framework to explore that. So again, there's a conservative cost assumption embedded because the gas systems would be cheaper than the all-electric. Aaron. Yeah, um, to your point about the question about the existing buildings, um, so the MSBA wouldn't fund accelerated repair projects on buildings that they don't see viable. So that's a pretty good inc inclination because they're continuing to fund accelerated repair projects on our other buildings where like PEC, for example, they won't. They won't fur further invest in a project in a building that they don't see viable for the long term. So that should help, you know, with a little bit of that question. Um, but... You know, and listening to Councillor Jordan and some of the points about, you know, we have to be able to pay for everything, and I couldn't agree with you more, but one of the main factors in growing a community is crime rate. One of the main correlations between crime rate is education. So the number one community for schools in Massachusetts is Lexington. They're an A+, and their crime rate is 0.7. Holyoke is a C-plus for schools, and our crime rate is a 9.68 for violent crimes. The number one statistic for home buyers to purchase in a community is crime rate. The number two is the schools. Holyoke is a city that was built for more than 60,000, yet we hover around only 40. As the number one realtor here, I can tell you time and time again, people don't move here because of our school system. People don't move here because of the crime rate. And one of the main ways we can improve crime rate is by providing a better education, which will in the long term help reduce the overall funding that's needed for police because there just simply won't be as much need because we will have less crime. And then to that point, we'll be able to grow our tax base by attracting more people to the city because the more residents that live here, the more people that will be dining out, the more people that will be shopping, the more people that will be paying excise tax and everything else that can contributes to a thriving community. So the main way that we're going to grow is by providing that quality education. Education is the foundation to everything. So I just wanted to put that point out and these are, you know, very easily findable statistics. So reduce crime by providing better education will attract more people to the city to provide us with more money for all the services that, that we deserve. Thank you. Councilor Blau. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks everybody for the presentation. So I, I have two questions. The first one is uh, concerning the cannabis money. Um, I, I've got a light down on, on Maine and Vern and I've been trying to get fixed and I've been told no with the cannabis. I've been asking about race crosswalks. So I, I'm curious if you can share some of the conversation about the cannabis funds and how, how we can legally use that for some of this stuff. You want me to talk about it? So um, we're working on, we've been having conversations with the marijuana companies. We've brought in um, outside uh, legal help that understands the cannabis law much better than, than what we understand it to be. Um, and then trying to understand, like, you know, how can we pivot in a way where it allows us to um, uh, maximize on this opportunity to build the middle school? And so there's some renegotiations that are taking place um, and um, uh, uh, new agreements that we're coming up with uh, so that we can um, uh, 
dedicate this funding source uh, to the schools. Um, so it's it's uh, it's something that's in the works right now. I have to get all everybody to agree to it. Um, the conversations have been overwhelmingly positive. There's been some new ideas um, that might produce a, a much better outcome than what we're talking about right now. Um, but it's going to require to 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 answer the question. It's going to require. Um, uh, uh, What's the word? It's not not a new agreement, but not a side agreement. Um, an extension. An extension yeah. agreement. Yeah. An extension agreement to the existing, so that we can um, dedicate this funding source uh, to the schools. Um, so that th those are some of the conversations we've been having with the the marijuana companies. Do you think those agreements would be ready before any vote? No. No, I mean, the, the, the important thing to note is that the assumptions that we have right now are based on what we have in the bank and based on uh, what we're able to do. Uh, you know, as the mayor mentioned, uh, you know, this is a, an area of law that's so um, uh, new, right, uncharted territory. So that's why the city's engaged with uh, KP Law uh, to help uh, with these conversations. So um, I would say that two things are at play right now. Uh, one is preserving, to Councillor Jordan's point, uh, the money that we already have in the bank. Uh, so there is a bit of a hold. I know that the council recently passed a number of, uh, a number of transactions, um, and those may be the last ones that you see for a while. Um, because the mayor has, the same way that he has indicated to city departments, just because a bond authorization took place doesn't mean we're going to borrow for that. We're going to find alternative revenue right. sources to pay for these projects. Same thing with the cannabis stabilization. We have the money in the bank now. This is the main priority of the city. We want to preserve those funds. Um, so that's what this is based on, is money that's currently in the bank. Uh, money that we know that we have uh, and money that we can dedicate. As I mentioned and, and as the council knows, those types of appropriations, you know, obviously the way this is all structured would have to flow as any other appropriation. The mayor uh, presents it through the auditor under the name of the chair of finance. It gets discussed in finance and gets, gets voted on. Um, but is what we are able to do is preserve the money that's in the bank right now. And as I've also mentioned in front of this body, um, that money along with a lot of our other monies uh, that we have in the bank, um, I have been investing not in the market, um, but in high yield interest rate products. Uh, we're the same way that uh, inflation is creating a lot of this escalation, uh, which has caused the costs of projects to go up. We're using it to our advantage right now. We're taking that money and we're putting it into products that are six months, 10 months, money that we are putting away now from a cash flow perspective. We know we'll be able to reap the benefit on that in the future. And those are also funds I would mention that would have to be appropriated by the council, but funds that we would hope would defer the costs of this project in the future. Cool, yeah, thank you. Um, my second question too, I, I wanted to go back to the parking and I, I guess I just wanted to hear more about the YWCA group and, and, and how they're using the law and the agreement. Because I, I, when Councilor Jordan asked that really good question, I was thinking about Dingle Road and if that was two million, I was starting to think about, okay, so we got this other parking. So, I mean, why, what's going on with that other parking lot with the YWCA and why isn't that able to be used? I, I can speak a little to that only because I have some historical knowledge of, of that. And I, I would also say that the reason that it's being used is uh, it's, it's not for after school programs. Um, I don't think we should be speaking in a public forum about some of the activities that happen, um, but I would say generally that YWCA is an organization that deals with a host of issues related to um, 
sorts of domestic violence for women uh, and children. And so this is something that uh, the city is able to offer as a, as a side benefit to be able to use parking as needed. Um, and it's not something that is necessarily something we're looking to make uh, any kind of money from. Um, and I hope that addresses that. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> any further discussion? have some follow-ups um, yeah. here and as a as we go forward and uh, look forward to those okay. appreciate everyone coming we uh, thank everyone for the presentation this evening as I said earlier for your hard work on the building committee the school department the mayor the treasurer um, all our invited guests and an incredibly uh, well thought out and good presentation for an incredibly well thought out good project and I think we all know why we want to do this and uh, I think we're going to, we should be able to do one more meeting and wrap a lot of this up if we get the, uh, some of the feedback that we were asking for, which mm -hmm. is pretty much in the works and just need to see it in uh, a little bit more in print. But uh, again, thank you all for, uh, for everything. Make a motion to table. Second. Motion may second table. that we table these items. No and, further uh, discussion. That will stand for uh, item five, five. Well, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so motion to table four and five. Four and five. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? They are on the table. Again, thank you. And uh, one more motion. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Let's not debate it. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Aye.